In this video, we'll be discussing the clinical anatomy and physiology of the serratus anterior muscle. And then later on in the video, we'll be discussing the consequences of serratus anterior weakness and palsy of the nerve that innervates it. So over here on the right, you see the serratus anterior muscle in green, and you can see it's composed of multiple heads that appear to go down the ribs. And overall, this muscle gets its name serratus because collectively each head here of the serratus anterior looks like the edges of a serrated steak knife. Now the origin of serratus anterior depends on which heads we're talking about. So if we look at the superior heads, there's actually three of them. There's this one right here, and then there's two that kind of go together. So head one, head two, and head three. These are really the superior heads, and they originate on ribs one and two and the intercostal fascia. You can see this one has its origin on rib one, and these two heads have their origin on rib two. So these are the superior heads and they're going to insert on the anterior surface of the scapular superior angle. So right here, here's the scapular superior angle, and you can see them insert on it right there. And then if we go down from that, we have the middle heads of the serratus anterior. These are the ones that originate off of ribs three through six. So here's rib three, four, five, and six. So these right here, these four heads, comprise the middle heads of serratus anterior, and they insert on the anterior surface of the scapular medial border. So here's the scapular medial border over here. And it's the anterior surface of it. Sometimes you'll hear the anterior surface of the scapula referred to as the costal surface, because if you think about it, the anterior surface of the scapula is in contact with the ribs, which get the term costal. And then if we go down from that, we have the inferior heads of the serratus anterior. These are the ones that will originate off of ribs 7, 8, and 9. So here's ribs 7, 8, and 9, so these three inferior heads. And they will insert on the anterior or costal surface of the scapular inferior angle, which is down here, and then the lower part of the medial border of the scapula. Now note that in some individuals there is some genetic variability in how many heads there are. Uh, there may be an extra head that extends to rib 10 and may also have an attachment on the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. Now what are the actions of serratus anterior? Well the big one that everyone thinks of is scapular protraction. And a fancy term for scapular protraction is scapulothoracic anterolateral glide. So what is scapular protraction? Well, scapular protraction is when the scapulas collectively move away from the midline of the body. Basically, they move away from the thoracic spinous processes. And so one movement where this would heavily be utilized is the upward phase of the bench press. Here's Eddie Hall bench pressing an absurd amount of weight. It would also be used in boxing when throwing a punch. Rocky's throwing a punch with his left arm right there. So the scapula is going to have to protract or abduct, as we might say, in addition to glenohumeral movement. Okay. The serratus anterior also participates in scapulothoracic upward rotation, basically upward rotation of the scapula. This would be utilized when you are abducting the shoulder joint. So when you go through shoulder or glenohumeral abduction, it's not just the humerus that moves relative to the glenoid fossa. You also have to have a corresponding scapular movement, and that would actually involve upward rotation. And so along with the upper and lower trapezius, the serratus anterior muscle facilitates scapulothoracic upward rotation. And then a big function of it is also to hold the scapula firmly on the thoracic wall. And when the serratus anterior muscle is weak, the scapula tends to separate away from the rib cage, away from the thoracic wall. And this produces something called scapular winging, which we will talk about in just a couple of minutes. And then the blood supply to serratus anterior is via the superior and lateral thoracic arteries, and also via the branches of the thoracodorsal artery. The serratus anterior muscle is innervated by the long thoracic nerve, which has contributions from nerve roots C5, C6, and C7. And in rare cases, some individuals have a little bit of contribution from the C8 nerve root, although that's uncommon. It's mainly C5 through C7. And you can see those contributions up here in green. Here's C5, here's C6, 
and C7, and we see they fuse together into the long thoracic nerve shown here in green. The nerve essentially passes over the first rib, and then underneath the clavicle, and then it goes down the anterolateral surface of these ribs, where it gives off motor branches to the serratus anterior. But what happens if somebody has an issue with the serratus anterior muscle itself, or the long thoracic nerve that innervates it? Well, they may end up developing a pathology known as scapular winging. And you can see a good example of scapular winging in this picture right here. This person's right scapula is normal. More than likely, they have an intact and fully functioning long thoracic nerve on the right, and their serratus anterior itself is strong on the right, or at least strong enough, right? I mean, we might be able to see a little bit of the medial border, a little bit of the lateral border here, especially if there's a low body fat percentage, uh, but you won't be able to see the scapula too prominently. But if we look at the left scapula, we see a very profound separation of it away from the thoracic wall, and this is scapular winging. And oftentimes it's most noticeable around the medial border of the scapula. Remember that one of the jobs of serratus anterior is to hold the scapula firmly against the thoracic wall. So if the scapula separates from the thoracic wall, you either have weakness of the serratus anterior, or you have some issue with the long thoracic nerve. And that brings up the pathophysiology of scapular winging. As we said before, a person could just have intrinsic weakness of the serratus anterior muscles. There's no issue with the long thoracic nerve in that case, it's just intrinsic muscular weakness, and the obvious treatment choice there would be to strengthen the serratus anterior muscles. But what if there is an issue with the long thoracic nerve? One issue could be palsy of the long thoracic nerve on one or both sides. And this is divided into three categories, non or atraumatic, traumatic, and iatrogenic. So non-traumatic palsy would be normally of viral origin. So somebody gets sick with some kind of virus and the virus ends up attacking the long thoracic nerve on one or both sides. Okay? And that will lead to weakness of the serratus anterior, not intrinsic, but due to nerve damage. And you also tend to see this in facial scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. You can also have traumatic palsy of the long thoracic nerve where there is some kind of physical damage. This is normally due to a sudden forceful scapular depression, repetitive arm movements as seen in athletes and household activities like digging, prolonged lying in bed with the arm abducted, prolonged propping up the head to read. Again, all these things can cause physical damage to the long thoracic nerve. And then finally, there's iatrogenic palsy of the long thoracic nerve, which can be caused by prolonged compression with a single axillary crutch if you're not using the crutch properly. Uh, mastectomies and spontaneous pneumothoraxes can also damage the long thoracic nerve. And then finally, another issue with the long thoracic nerve may not involve damage at all. Maybe the nerve just doesn't move well as the body moves about different joints. So there's adverse neurodynamics of the long thoracic nerve. Now the basic treatment approach, which we're gonna be covering over the course of the next couple of videos, is gonna depend on the patient's specific impairments. So obviously, you're probably gonna to have to strengthen the serratus anterior. If the serratus anterior is weak, you strengthen it. But the patient may also have very tight musculature that opposes the serratus anterior. Maybe some of the scapular musculature, like the rhomboids, are tight. Maybe the pectoralis minor is tight. Maybe the lats are tight. Those don't specifically control the scapula, but tight lats are often associated with scapular winging. And then also cervical muscles may also be tight. So basically just stretching those tight muscles. And then in addition to strengthening the serratus anterior, we may need to do neurodynamic gliding exercises of the long thoracic nerve. And this would be done if you suspect the patient has adverse neurodynamics of the long thoracic nerve. And again, these treatments I'll be demonstrating for you over the next couple of videos. So hopefully this video gives you a good understanding of thoracic. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.